Well, good morning, Salem. I'm glad you're all here this morning. A great opportunity for us to gather together in the house of the Lord and be able to raise his name on high as we talk about this idea of keeping his name hallowed both inside these walls and probably the greater challenge is to keep it hallowed outside these walls. If you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, or maybe this is your first time worshiping with us, we're right in the middle of a uh, series uh, talking about prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, Jesus uh, finishes praying. Uh, again, we don't know exactly what the setting was, but he probably says, amen, and for some reason, the disciples look right at him and they say, hey, Jesus, could you, could you teach us to pray? And when they ask that question, Jesus obviously obliged, but he obliged by giving us this prayer that we just finished uh, stating as a, as a whole church. And uh, in, in typical church fashion, I think what we've done is we've taken this prayer and we've memorized it, which I think is actually a really valuable thing to do. I think anytime we can memorize scripture and recite it back, it's just powerful for us because we believe God's word is true. We also believe God's word holds power. But I think it was also not just for us to learn to recite, but Jesus was teaching us. So as we walk through the Lord's Prayer this summer, we're really looking at it through this lens of Jesus' teaching. So why of all things did Jesus say the phrases that he said as he taught us to pray? Last week we walked through this particular phrase, our Father who art in heaven, and it was this great reminder to us of what it means to have a Father, a Father who loves us unconditionally, a Father who loves us not because of what we do, not because of what we bring to the table. We walked back through Luke 15, if you want to go back and read that story, the story of the prodigal son, son coming over and the father running to him, wrapping his arms around him, killing the fatted calf, putting a ring on his finger, a cloak on his back, and throwing a party because this son who was lost has been found. I think sometimes we as adults, the longer that we live, the more we start getting a bit skeptical about life and being reminded that sometimes we need to remember we're the kid and we've got a father and that we can approach God as our father, much like the prodigal son, and remind ourselves that he always loves us, always hears us, always answers us. And the who art in heaven, just this reminder that God isn't just a God who's way out there. Yes, he's way out there, but he's also right here as we're reminded that when God uh, when God's name is called by two or three, he promises to be in the presence of them and in the midst of them. And so it was this great reminder if we've got a God who's also our father and he's not just way out there, he's right here. Today we're going to jump into this whole thing of Hollywood. Kind of interesting. How many of you have used really Hollywood in the last week unless you prayed this prayer? Anybody? Real regular word that we use, right? So it's interesting as we talk about this whole concept of keeping God's name holy, that'd probably be the more uh, more culturally relevant word that we would use today to, you know, keep God's name holy. And what I want us to lean into today is we think in terms of why did Jesus use this particular phrase as he's teaching us, remember, teaching us to pray. It's not just that we're supposed to remember that his name is holy, but we're also called to keep his name holy, to keep his name raised up within the culture and not bring it down. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. So let's think in terms of um, in the Old Testament, God's name was this. It was Yahweh. I'm going to get, oops, just did that wrong. Ah. So anyway, so Yahweh, so I, I love Hebrew because Hebrew reads from uh, right to left. And for me, it's this great reminder of Old Testament stuff. When I was studying in, uh, in uh, seminary, I really much more enjoyed reading Hebrew. It was just more unique. Uh, Greek for me was not quite as fun, but uh, necessary because it's what the New Testament was written in. So as I got the opportunity to be able to read through these things, the, the Israelites, they did what the church often does, right? So the second commandment says that we're not supposed to misuse God's name. And so what the Israelites did was they said, well, if God's name is Yahweh, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to ban using the word Yahweh, and we're just going to call him something else. So we've got names like Jehovah, we've got names like Lord, we've got uh, different names that we use. Obviously, as Jesus came and became God incarnate, we use the name Jesus, but what's interesting is the Israelites just chose to avoid the word Yahweh and in so doing thought that they were keeping the commandment. But that's not the point. 
The point is, is that we're not supposed to just not misuse the name, but we're actually supposed to keep it holy. And so we want to wrestle through that this morning. What was interesting was, um, I always thought that it was, um, now that I remember what I'm doing here, um, get that right before somebody uh, calls me up or one of my seminary buddies busts my chops about this. But so at any rate, his name, um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but we finally uncovered in the 21st century what God's name is. Take a look. What is God's name? Howard. Who? Howard. Howard? How do you know his name is Howard? Because? Because what? Our Father, who is in heaven, Howard be thy name. Who? Howard be thy name. Howard be thy name? Well, now we know it, guys. I mean, if you thought it was Yahweh, we, we've got it. This little girl's figured it out. Howard be thy name. thought that was great. It's Hallowed, obviously, but uh, since it's not a word that we tend to use, this poor girl heard Howard. So apparently God's name is Howard. All right, let's keep pushing forward. So I thought to myself, what are the kinds of things that we hallow in our culture today? I want you to, I'm just going to wrestle through some things really quickly that are hallowed in the Kneekirk household, and you've probably got things in your household that are hallowed, and you just, you don't even really think about it, but what are the things that we set apart, and they're just kind of holy, like you don't step on these things, and I thought to myself, so I've got a son who uh, played golf all the way through college, and I've learned that golf clubs are pretty hallowed. Um, so my son, when he was little, he would play with any set of clubs. Now my son has a custom set of clubs that he's uh, got, his own specific driver. Like, I, who knew that there were, like, all these different kinds of shafts and all these different, like, he'll only play with certain golf balls. Like, he's a total golf snob. And if you're ever playing golf with my son, trust me, don't touch his clubs. Apparently they're hollowed. You don't play with them unless you're at least a scratch golfer or better. So I've just learned, you know, all I do is like polish them for him, you know, if he even lets me caddy. So golf clubs. And then this one was interesting to me as I was thinking back about my childhood. My dad, my mom's the much more meticulous person in our household, so I'm the one that takes after her in many ways. It's why my hair's never out of place, those kinds of things. Get that from my mom. My dad, not necessarily, but man, when my dad paints, that dude is meticulous. And he had a very specific paintbrush that was made out of horse hair. And I'm telling you that as a kid, if I so much as touched that paintbrush, I was in deep trouble because my dad kept that thing absolutely flawless so that when he would paint with it, it did what it was supposed to do. So in our household, dad's paintbrush, hollowed. No shoes in the house. My uh, parents were missionaries in the Philippines, and so one of the things that changed in my life, it was just kind of a cultural thing there, that when you would go into somebody's house, you would take your flip-flops or whatever you were wearing, and take them off before you entered the house. Part of it was it was a pretty dusty uh, culture, um, not a lot of rain there at moments, and so you would just take your shoes off. And so something that's kind of become a, a natural thing in our household is we take shoes off before we come in our house. This one I thought was kind of funny. Um, at our household, if you happen to come for Thanksgiving dinner, I'm just telling you, we determine when dinner is served based upon when the Detroit Lions play. Like that is just hallowed ground in our household. I've actually determined that um, I've become somewhat prophetic. I've been saying for 10 years, restore the roar in 2024. I just want you all to hear. It has a nice ring to it. The Lions are not going to be embarrassing in 2024. And if you call me between, it's probably 11.30 and 2.30 on Thanksgiving, I'm not going to answer. Okay? Hallowed ground. Last one, my yard. My team was uh, going to make me go outside with a pair of scissors and like clip grass. If you come to my house, my backyard is like my little oasis. On Fridays, if I don't have stuff going on here at Salem, I'm under some little headphones and I just shut out the world and do my thing. Uh, my daughter's boyfriend was over recently and uh, he was over, happened to be over on Friday and I was mowing my lawn. And Gabrielle informed me later in the day that uh, he was mocking me mercilessly for the way in which I was just meticulously laying stripes on my yard. And I said, well, how else do you mow your yard? So anyway, so the, these are sort of things that in our culture, you've got your own things in your household. These are some of the things in mine. And what I started to think was, so of all things, why, why would God, when asked, teach us to pray, say, keep my name holy? Because here's the thing, do, does God need us to keep his name holy? And the answer is no. God's name is holy whether you keep it holy or not. The issue here is, is that I think this is, that Jesus is pushing us a little bit here to say that it's not just enough to, to not misuse it. He's saying, I want you to, as you pray, raise it up. The way that you live, the way that you function, the way that you use my name. So why would Jesus to teach us to pray about this? And I thought, well, culturally, I think we struggle with this. So for instance, culturally, this has just become a normal thing. 
OMG. For those of you that are 60 and up, that means, oh my God, okay? Um, maybe you didn't know that. Hopefully you did. Some of these get worse. But think about this. This is probably the best one of my list of four that have become culturally acceptable ways for us to speak. So, for instance, you might actually use this in a way that makes sense in which you're actually keeping God's name holy. So, maybe you walk out in the morning and you see uh, this unbelievable sunrise and you say to yourself, oh my God, that is stunning. Like, that's actually suggesting that God's the one who painted the sky. You're using His name and presenting it as, look at what God's doing. That one actually makes sense. But, you know, culturally, we use this word as way more than that. It just sort of rolls off our tongues, and much like the Israelites, we might change it and go, oh my gosh, as though somehow that changes it, right? So instead of using the word Yahweh, I'm going to use another name, and so therefore I haven't misused God's name? No, hey, look, look at what we're doing. Culturally, we've gotten to a spot where we let God's name keep going down. We're letting it become average, we're letting it become normal. Sometimes we use this word, which is the Savior of the world. And we'll use it as an expletive. This one is unbelievable to me. Uh, it's a family show here at Salem, so I'm not going to fill in the blank, but you know what I'm talking about. And here's the thing. Have you ever really considered what you're saying? I mean, like, do you really want that hammer to go to hell? Do you really want God to bring down all the power that he has in order to be able to deal with that person in your life, and you really want that? I know we haven't really thought it through, but that's the point, right? I mean, we're, when we don't think about things, it suggests where it fits on the priority list. And what Jesus is saying is when you use my name, it ought to mean something. And we ought to recognize that it's set apart and that it's holy. Do we approach it that way? This one I thought was just kind of interesting as I was asking people this week, you know, kind of how they maybe wind up misusing God's name. And you know, we'll just use this one by, you know, somebody will do some knucklehead kind of thing. We'll be like, good Lord, who thought that was a good idea? And the point being is, look at how we've reduced how we use his name. How many of you remember the movie Lion King? I realize I'm aging myself here. So in the movie The Lion King, you've got this uh, king who's named Mufasa, right? And he's got this son named Simba who's going to become the next king. And then Mufasa has a brother in Scar who's kind of the bad guy in this whole deal. And Scar wants to be king, blah, blah, blah. Lots of family drama going on. So in this moment, Scar wants to take over. And so Scar finally goes in and he's talking to the hyenas. And the hyenas are going to be the bad guys that are going to try to help him overthrow Mufasa. And what's interesting is the word Mufasa is said. And if you remember correctly, what happens to the hyenas the minute the word Mufasa is said? They all go, ooh. And then one of the hyenas who's kind of goofy, he goes, say it again. And somebody goes, Mufasa. And they'll go, ooh. My question to you is, when's the last time God's name did that to you? You see, we've made it such a, eh, Jesus, God, Lord, Yahweh. Ooh. I thought it might be really helpful for us this morning just to walk through the first three commandments, thinking in terms of these are the ones that target us toward who God is and why his name is to be hallowed. And we talked in the first week of the series about the fact that the reason we pray is because we recognize there's a God and we're not him. I mean, otherwise, why would you talk to some invisible being? You shall have no other gods before me. What this really comes down to is a priority issue. And sometimes they break this thing down into two and they'll say, not only should you have no other gods, but you should have no graven images. And so the whole issue for us in our culture today is, what are the things that are the highest priority in your life? And is God the top? Is he really? Like if somebody would do a, a look at your life, would they draw this conclusion by spending some time with you? This particular passage in Matthew is right after Jesus was baptized and he goes out into the wilderness. He's out there for 40 days, 40 nights being tempted by Satan. Satan's kind of messing with his head because he's hungry, he's tired, all these kinds of things. And so Satan's trying to tempt Jesus to be able to use his power for reasons that are not helpful and not what God would want him to do. 
And so Jesus, man, who's also God, right, he's fighting with Satan in this moment, in this temptation, finally looks at him and says, look, Satan, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's it. He's the only one that we worship. He's the only one that we serve. And when we keep that priority in line, then some of this stuff about his name becomes a really normal thing. But culturally, we find ourselves looking at other kinds of stuff and and putting our priorities in different places. And so what's interesting is I think that in our culture, intellect has taken a really high level. So Proverbs 3, 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean, lean, not on this. Now look, I'm, I'm not standing here this morning saying that education isn't important. I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn, that we shouldn't use our minds. The issue is, is recognizing from whom the intellect comes and what are we using the intellect to accomplish. And so the writer of Proverbs is simply saying to you, don't trust in yourself, don't trust in your own intellect, trust in God. And so as Christ followers, we remind ourselves that there's something greater than you and me. And when we make intellect the top, then that's become our God. And I believe that culturally at moments that's become true, that we put our own intellect above God himself and fail to remember that he's the one that gave us the intellect in the first place. The second commandment probably leans more into this concept of name because it says that we're not supposed to misuse his name. Sometimes, um, depending upon the translation that you look at, it shall say you shall not uh, curse uh, the name of the Lord your God, some of those kinds of things. In our, our catechism within our church body that Martin Luther wrote, he said, well, so what does this mean that we're not supposed to misuse the name of God? And so Martin Luther writes, well, we should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it. Take a look at Psalm 50 this week. Call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So he talks about all the things we're not supposed to do, right? And then these are the things. Call upon it when you're in trouble. Call upon it when you pray. Call upon it when you worship. Call upon it when you give thanks. And so I thought to myself, interestingly, in the book of Leviticus, there was this moment where the Israelites would find themselves sort of using God's name as a way to leverage things. I think sometimes we do that, don't we? I mean, sometimes we put a fish on something. We'll we'll say, you know, I'm I'm a... I'm a Christian, therefore you should do business with me instead of with somebody else. And look, guys, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm simply saying when we leverage our faith for something other than keeping God's name holy, I think we got to be a little careful. Because sometimes what we're doing is drawing attention to ourselves and painting ourselves as better than we are. Because even as Christ followers, we deal with the same thing that everybody else does, which is that deep down in the recesses of our soul, we're selfish, self-centered, broken individuals. And so if we want to draw attention to anything, we want to draw attention to the power of God and the power of his name. In Exodus, when God gave the commandments to Moses, he gave the commandment and he said, I'm not going to hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name. It sure is a good thing that we've got a father who forgives us because I don't think there's anybody in this room that can say at some point we've always kept God as the top priority and that we haven't misused his name. The third commandment pushes us even further and reminds us not only are we supposed to keep him first, not only are we not supposed to misuse his name, but we're also supposed to make sure that we remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Interesting, isn't it? Let's remember that there's a God, we're not him. Let's not misuse his name. Let's keep his name holy. And let's remember this thing called the Sabbath day. If God can do it in six days and rest on the seventh, we ought to be able to do it. And yet we live in a culture that raises up this busyness like some badge of honor. And what God is saying is, trust me. Don't lean on your own understanding. If I can do it in six, so can you. The book of Hebrews puts it this way, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day.
approaching. Isn't it interesting that here we are in the 21st century? The same issue that existed in the first century exists in the 21st. There's things getting in the way, priorities. God first. Trust in Him. So I was thinking about how to close this thing out this morning. I was thinking, okay, so do we have to do this? And the answer is no. I mean, we kind of started here, right? I mean, we're not the ones who keep his name holy, but Jesus is saying to us when we asked him, teach us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed, holy be your name. So why would Jesus do that? Because look, as our culture continues to move forward, we're the ones that push back against the culture. We're the answer that God gives us the church. And so the way in which we continue to raise his name up demonstrates what we believe and what we know to be true. And so I found myself as, as trying to wrestle through, where would I go with this? I found myself going back to the song of Mary. So I'll leave you with this this morning. So Mary, at early teenage years, her whole life gets blown up. God decides to take this girl who's trying to do everything right. She's engaged to be married, and suddenly she finds herself pregnant. You can imagine the chatter that's taken place around where she lives. Nobody's buying the story. She finally escapes and goes off to her Aunt Elizabeth's house and stays there for several months. Finally comes back and has this baby. I'm telling you, for the rest of Mary's life, I can just imagine when she went to the corner diner and had breakfast with Joseph. Isn't that? And yet, when Mary found out the news, even though he, she knew her life would forever be changed, she also knew the world would be changed. And she said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, meaning herself. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. And we could stop there and it would make the point, but here's the last thing that she says before she goes on. Holy is his name. It's this reminder that God is sovereign. It's this reminder that he is holy, that his name holds power, and that we live our lives in his presence, recognizing that he's in control that he's our dear father, and that it's, it's his world. So let's continue to pray on his name, and let's continue to be a people that instead of bringing the, the world down here, let's raise God's name up. So let's go to God in his name. Father God, we thank and praise you for the privilege of being able to gather together in your house this morning. Every time we walk into this place, we're reminded of words in Scripture that say where two or three are gathered into your name, you are in there in the midst of them. And so it's so incredible for us to know that the God of the universe, the one who put it all into motion, is right here in this place. And God, we begin this morning by confessing that there's been moments, maybe more than we'd like to admit, where we haven't kept your name holy. Not only have we not been neutral, but we've actually gone the other direction and used your name in not great ways. So God, we thank you for your forgiveness. It's new every morning. We ask that you continue to work in our lives, that we might raise your name up. For it says in Scripture that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So God, may we be those kind of people that draw men and women and families to you, that they might know your power and your grace. To that end, God, we pray these words in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're celebrating Holy.